Greetings from uh, Cape Canaveral, Florida. We're so glad to be back with you for another Waves of Hope Chapel service. Uh, I've been reading in the book of Isaiah, and I'll tell you what, the Isaiah 52, 53, especially 54, 55, amazing uh, chapters that I would encourage you to read. I just want to read a few verses from Isaiah 55. It says, Seek the Lord while you may find him. Call on him now while he is near. Let the wicked change their ways and banish the very thought of doing wrong. Let them turn to the Lord that he may have mercy on them. Yes, turn to our God, for he will forgive generously. Wow. Uh, I'm so happy that Wendy is going to be singing here in a minute, and then Bill Steinbrook will be bringing the word. And so let's begin with prayer. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that you do forgive generously. Thank you, Lord, that uh, when we come to you, that you hear us, that you uh, help us to be made more like Jesus. And I pray that that would be the case. Father, I pray that you would open our ears today, open our hearts and our minds, open our eyes, that we can hear from you and and see from your perspective i pray for hope today for those that don't have it i pray father for those that are quarantining that you would help them to have a sense of your presence and that you would comfort them for those who have experienced loss lord i pray that the same thing for them and i pray your healing power for those that are not well father we thank you for your grace for your love and your mercy and uh, we thank you for this time and we dedicate it to you in jesus name amen Whoops. Hold on. Let me fix this. I'm a little shorter. <laughs> All right. Sing with me. Oh, how I love Jesus. There is a name I love to hear. I love to sing its worth. It sounds like music in my ears. The sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. It tells me of a Savior's love who died to set me free. It tells me of his precious blood, the sinner's perfect plea. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus, because he first loved me. It tells of one whose loving heart can feel my deepest woe, who in each sorrow bears a part that none can bear below. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus, because he first loved me. Morning, folks. Hello to everyone around the world, crew members, volunteers, supporters, friends, and family. Welcome today. We're going to have some fellowship, some faith, some following, some friendship, and some fun. Sometimes I, I think uh, some of these early books in the Bible are so difficult to understand, and it's not always fun. But as I read, I'm learning that it can be fun, 
and it's really interesting if you look for what God's trying to tell us. A quick prayer. Father God, help us with the wisdom and the clarification and understanding of your word today. You speak through all of us, but speak to each person listening today that they will get your message and understand what it is that you need them to know. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Folks, today, if you, as you get out your Bibles from yesterday, we are in 2 Kings chapter 9, verse 1 to 29. Once again, that's 2 Kings chapter 9, verse 1 to 29. I'm going to be reading using the NIV today. I uh, usually use the King James or the New King James. It's just the NIV reads a little better on some of this. Verse 1 out of chapter 9, 2 Kings. The prophet Elijah, Elisha, summoned a man from the company of the prophets and said to him, Tuck your cloak into your belt. Take this flask of oil with you and go to Ramoth Gilead. When you get there, look for Jehu, son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nishmi. Go to him, get him away from his companions and take him into an inner room. Then take the flask and pour the oil on his head and declare, This is what the Lord says, I anoint you king over Israel. Then open the door and run. <laughs> Don't delay it. That's interesting. We're going to talk about that. <laughs> then open the door and run. Don't delay. Verse 4. So the young prophet went to Ramoth Gilead. When he arrived, he found the army officers sitting together. I have a message for you, commander, he said. For which of us, asked Jehu. For you, commander, he replied. Jehu got up and went into the house. Then the prophet poured the oil on Jehu's head and declared, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I anoint you, king over the Lord's people, Israel. You are to destroy, you are to destroy the house of Ahab, your master, and I will avenge the blood of my servants, the prophets, and the blood of all the Lord's servants shed by Jezebel. The whole house of Ahab will perish. I will cut off from Ahab every last male in Israel, slave or free. I will make the house of Ahab like the house of jo Jer Jeroboam, son of Nebat, like the house of Basha of Ahiah. As for Jezebel, dogs will devour her on the plot of ground at Jezreel, and no one will bury her. Then he opened the door and ran. When Jehu went out to his fellow officers, one of them asked him, Is everything all right? Why did, you, why did this maniac come to you? You know the man and the sort of things he says, Jehu replied. That's not true, they said. Tell us. Jehu said, Here's what he told me. This is what the Lord says. I anoint you king over Israel. They quickly took off their cloaks and spread them, under, spread them under him on the bare steps. Then they blew the trumpet and shouted, Jehu is king. So Jehu, son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nishmi, conspired against Joram. Now Joram and all Israel had been defending Ramoth Gilead against Hazel, king of Aram. But King Joram had returned to Jezreel to recover from the wounds the Arameans had inflicted on him in the battle with Hazel, the king of Aram. Jehu said, If you desire to make me king, don't let anyone slip out of the city to go and tell the news to Jezreel. Then he got into his chariot and rode to Jezreel, because Joram was resting there, and Ahaziah, king of Judah, had gone down to see him. When the lookout, standing on the tower in Jezreel, saw Jehu's troops approaching, he called out, I see some troops coming. Get a horseman, Joram ordered. Send him to meet them and ask, Do you come in peace? The horseman rode off to meet Jehu and said, This is what the king says. Do you come in peace? What do you have to do with peace? Jehu replied, Fall in behind me. The lookout reported, the messenger has reached them, but he's not coming back. So the king sent out a second horseman. When he came to them, he said, this is what the king says, do you come in peace? Jehu replied, what do you have to do with peace? 
fall in behind me. The lookout reported, He has reached them, but he's not coming back either. The driving is like that of Jehu, son of Nishmis, Nish, Nimshi. He drives like a maniac. I lost my place here. Okay. Hitch up to my chariot, Joram ordered. And when he... And when it was hitched up, Joram, king of Israel, and Ahizah, king of Judah, rode out, each in his own chariot, to meet Joram, uh, Jehu. They met him at the plot of ground that belonged to Naboth the Jezreelite. When Joram saw Jehu, he asked, Have you come in peace, Jehu? How can there be peace? Jehu replied, As long as all the idolatry and witchcraft of your mother Jezebel abound. Joram turned about and fled, calling out to Ahizah, Treachery, Ahizah! Then Jehu drew his bow and shot Joram between the shoulders. The arrow pierced his heart, and he slumped down in his chariot. Jehu said to Bidkar, his chariot officer, Pick him up and throw him on the field that belonged to Naboth the Jezreelite. Remember how you and I were riding together in chariots behind Ahab his father when the Lord spoke this prophecy against him? Yesterday I saw the blood of Naboth, the blood of his sons, declares the Lord, and I will surely make you pay for it on this plot of land, declares the Lord. Now then pick him up and throw him on the plot in accordance with the words of the Lord. When Ahizah, king of Judah, saw what happened, he fled up the road to Beth Hagan. Jehu chased him, shouting, Kill him too! They wounded him in his chariot on the way up to Gur near Ibilim. But he escaped to Megiddo and died there. His servants took him by chariot to Jerusalem and buried him with his ancestors in his tomb in the city of David. In the eleventh year of Joram, son of Ahab, Ahizah had become king of Judah. Folks, that's a lot to understand, and it's not very easy, I'll be quite honest with you. But I think it's a good message in here for us. Let's remember, earlier and even back to 1 Kings, uh, 2 Kings for sure, all the deceit, all the lying, all the dishonor and failures of all the kings, none of them, or very few of them, were any good. So, uh, Jerome, Jerome, um, had his problems. He had lied before God. He had dishonored God, and God was going to pay him back. So this whole idea in the first 29 verses of chapter 9, a commission is sent by Jehu by the hand of one of the prophets to take, up, take upon him and destroy the house of Ahab. This comes from God. Remember, um, the prophecies of God are true. And they're his prophecies. We live under this idea that God is going to make it happen if that's what he wants. We may think the killing and, and things like this are wrong, but God had laid before these people what they need to do. So first off, I thought it was interesting that Elisha um, summoned one of the young prophets from the company of prophets. So there was many prophets working together. And it was probably because Elisha was too old at that point to go do it himself. Um, we have the anointing of Jehu to be king, who was at this time a commander, probably commander-in-chief, but it doesn't really say. He's with his other fellow officers, and so they're sitting there. Um, prior to sitting there, this young prophet, we don't have his name, but he's given the flask, and he's told what to do. He's told to anoint Je uh, Jehu king over Israel and then run away which I thought was interesting that he asked him to told him to run away because God knew there was going to be a lot of turmoil and God knew that Jehu was had a mission then and that the young prophet had nothing to do with that so I thought it was interesting too when the young prophet arrived arrived and all the commanders are sitting around let's say they're having dinner or something they're sitting there and the young prophet says, I have a message for you, commander. 
And Jehu's the one that spoke. I think he, he may have known something was going on because he said, for which of us? And he says, for you. Now, Jehu didn't see himself, uh, some of the commentaries will say, Jehu didn't see himself above others, even though he was going to get this anointing. And there was actually even some, some commentaries write that maybe Jehu was anointed already by Eliza further back, just like David was anointed a long time before he became king. Um, so there is some, some good commentary out there if you'd like to read it. So the specific instructions again from God for the young prophet was Jehu got up, went out of the house, poured the oil on Jehu's head and declared, this is what the Lord says, the God of Israel. I anoint you king over Lord, the Lord's people Israel. You are to destroy the house of Ahab, your master. That's the house that Joram was in. And I will avenge the blood of my servants and the prophets and the blood of all the Lord's servants shed by Jezebel. Because Jezebel, as we know, was just a horrible person killing people, killing prophets, and not doing the Lord's work at all. So the Lord remembered this. And it goes on to say, The whole house of Ahab will, will perish. I will cut off from Ahab every last male in Israel, free or slave. I will make the house of Ahab like the house of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, like the house of Basha and Ahi, Ahiha. So during the discussion, I'm sorry, during the reading, when Jehu went out, is everything all right? And he says, oh, don't worry about the maniac. You know, those guys are out there doing it. I thought it was interesting that second time, um, oh, they make fun. I, later on, they're going to use the word maniac again in this particular writing. But non-believers, let's face it, folks, as Christians out there, non-believers will make fun of us, will make fun of people. They'll put people down. He could have just said, well, the young prophet or the young man, but he called him a maniac. So I thought that was interesting. Um, the other officers are not jealous that Jehu became king. They, they, they kind of expected it, I think. As I read it twice, three times over the last couple of days, I think they expected it. Jehu had something about him. So uh, he said, tell us what they said. And Jehu said, oh, you know, that guy, the sorts of things he say, the prophets, you never can trust them. That's not true, they said. Tell us. They demanded. Tell us. Tell us what. So then Jehu had told his friends. Jehu told his friends. This is what the Lord says. I anoint you king over Israel. Can you recognize when, in your life, folks, can you recognize when the words come directly from God? Because, again, it doesn't have to. We're not going to be anointed kings of Israel, but this is what the Lord says. I anoint you king over Israel. So the Lord comes to you many times. I'm sure he comes to me, the folks here at the ministry. Can you recognize? That's the question for you. Is one of the takeaways today. Can you recognize when it's the word of God coming to you and when it's not the word of God? The other officers recognized it. Jehu had no proof. Remember, the young prophet rushed in poured the oil in secret in the back room, and then he took off. So Jehu comes out, and all he had was the word of God. And this is what the Lord says, I anoint you king over Israel. Now, they may have seen the oil on his head running down over his body. Okay, that's fine. But we have to remember that the word of God was speaking to the people around them, the other officers. So they quickly, they quickly recognized it. Because in verse 13 it says, they quickly took off their robes and their cloaks and put them down on the ground so the king could stand there. And they blew the trumpet, Jehu is king. So I want you to think about that, is recognizing the word of God in your life and recognizing the word of God in other people's lives. So the next sections, beginning in chapter or verse 14, Jehu kills Joram and Ahizah. And um, surprise was important. Remember he said... Um, that uh, Joram and Ahizah were in Ramoth Gilead. They'd been battling. Jerom had been injured, and Ahizah had been visiting him. So I just want to lead into this for a minute. Think about who you associate with. God had a, an issue with Ahizah anyway. And God would have probably dealt with him at another time. But Ahizah happened to be with 
Jerome. So, Jehu said, if you desire to make me king, don't let anyone slip out. We want to come as a surprise, is what he's saying. So, he, the, the, where they were at, they were about a one day's march from Ramoth Gilead, from where they were at. So, they wanted to be surprised. So, Jehu ends up going, I mean, uh, yeah, Jehu ends up going there to confront Jerome and Ahizah. And again, I want to stress hanging around with the wrong people in your life, maybe people that are corrupt. It's not that they're, uh, I don't want to say don't hang around with non-believers because I think as Christians we should hang around and, and try to help non-believers get to know the Lord and come to know Jesus. But hanging around the wrong people when it comes to the things they do, their actions, their words, their deeds, you have to be mindful of that. This is a, another message in this story here, folks. So, this is a battle zone. So, the soldiers don't know what to expect as Jehu's coming up. They see the troops coming, and that's when the, the king says, Hey, go out, and, go out and check these guys out. And he says, Do you come in peace? Jehu was going to have none of that. He wasn't going to tip his hand. Just like sometimes the Lord gives us something. We don't have to tip our hand right away. He said, Fall in behind me. That means he was taken prisoner. The first horseman was taken prisoner. Jehu wasn't going to let him ride back up and tell the king who was coming. So then the king sent a second person. Same thing. Do you come in peace? Jehu said, fallen behind me. So he kept two of them prisoners. Now, the uh, look, lookout reported that they're both there, but nobody's coming back. The driving is like that of Jehu, son of Nishmish. He drives like a maniac. So, again, I thought it was interesting in this translation. Some of the other translations use two different words, but um, I thought it was interesting that they called him a maniac. And, again, I think in our lives, when we confront the secular world we live in, sometimes there's name-calling, sometimes there is persecution, and we have to be ready for that, folks. I think that's just a reminder that it's not only happening to us, it happens to other people, and it happened to other people in the Bible. People who believe and follow God, we're not maniacs. We love the Lord, but sometimes the world, the secular world we live in, will will cause us to uh, feel like we're persecuted. So, Joram and Ahizah go out to meet Jehu. They don't know it's Jehu at the time. They think it is. They're not suspecting they're about to be killed. But from their history, they must have known in their hearts that they haven't lived the righteous life but they were living as kings and they weren't putting up with anything about what the Lord wanted them to do. So again, Ahiza was riding along with the wrong person. I ask you today, who are you riding along with in your life that might not be providing you with the stability and the love and the growth opportunities that you really need in your life? So when Joram saw Jehu, he asked, have you come in peace? Now, I thought that was interesting because maybe, maybe Joram had a guilty conscience from everything that had happened before. Maybe he's expecting something, and now here it is. The revelation from God was, was to come right now. So he says, have you come in peace? And Jehu says, how can there be peace? He must have been really agitated if you think about everything that Jezebel and it happened under Joram. So Jehu replied, as long as the idolatry and witchcraft of your mother, Jezebel, abounds, there will be no peace. I believe, from reading this, if Joram and Aziah had repented and asked forgiveness of God, God would have granted them. He would have heard them and granted them forgiveness, but they didn't. They kept turning their backs on them. So, Joram, at that moment, realized he's in trouble. And I encourage you all, before you're in trouble, folks, before, you re before the trouble comes, realize it before it comes. Repent, ask forgiveness for whatever it is, because we, have a, we serve and have a loving God, and he blesses us when we come to him. So God's plan is going to be complete here in a couple of, couple of verses. <laughs> Jehu drew his bull and shot Joram between his shoulders. The arrow pierced his heart, and he slumped dead in the chariot. Okay? So you have to figure, Jehu's in a chariot. I've never been in a chariot, but just think about it. It's probably moving around, and then Joram takes off on his, so he had to be a pretty good shot. Maybe it was guided by God. Who knows? But 
Jehu shoots Joram, and Joram dies. And it all goes back to the prophecy of the Lord comes true again. Remember back in earlier chapters, pick him up and throw him on the field that belonged to Naboth the Jezreelite. Remember how you and I were riding together in the chariots behind Ahab, his father, and, his, and the father, when the Lord spoke, this prophecy, yesterday I saw the blood of Naboth and the blood of his sons, declares the Lord, and I will surely make you pay for it on this plot of ground. So even even there, maybe Joram kind of recognized, oh my gosh, I'm in, I'm in uh, Ramoth Gilead, and this is what was spoken before. Who knows what he thought, but I believe God works in people that way. The very sight of the ground was enough to make Joram tremble and Jehu triumph because of the Lord. For Joram had, had the guilt of Naboth's blood fighting against him, and Jehu had the force of Elijah's curse fighting for him. The circumstances of the events are sometimes so ordered by the divine providence of God that makes the punishment answer to the sin. Just as we look in the mirror and we see ourselves, the, the punishment of the Lord answers that sin that had happened. So when Ahizah, and again, folks, I, I think one of the messages I got from this was who do we hang around with and what trouble might we be in by hanging around with the wrong people. So when Ahiza, king of Judah, saw what happened, what did he do? He took off. Jehu and his men chased him, shouting, kill him too. They wounded him in his chariot on the way up to Gur near Ibelium. But he escaped to Megiddo and he died there. So maybe God looked at it this way. You get two for the price of one. Jehu got to take care of two, two of God's problems. But the, the key, folks, as we wrap this up, is to think about the prophecies of God are always true. If you run into somebody in your life that's call, uh, claiming to be a prophet, might be. I'm not saying that God can't still send prophets, but it has to be 100% true and it has to align with what the Bible says. But God's prophets always, prophecy always comes true, and he will avenge those that are not righteous and people that have killed his people or taken away from the kingdom. God's going to reckon uh, reconcile the whole day. So I leave you folks with this um, scriptures today. Go back and read it again. Prepare for tomorrow's reading. We're glad you're here. We're glad we got to be here. I'm, I'm so blessed and thankful that I could share this time with you all. God bless you all. Keep safe and be strong. Uh, in Jesus' name, amen.